It has been the season of the special guest here on the Pulpit Side podcast, and it is time to bring to put a bow on season <laughs> two. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is putting that bow on season two. It's good to see everyone, or I should say, it is good to either be seen or heard by those who are watching and or hearing. I am Pastor Koe, and I'm Pastor Jesse. We want to welcome you to the pulpit aside uh, as we deal with our uh, well, season finale, not season opener, season, season finale. Season finale, season two. Yes, uh, we've had quite the time with the different guests that we've invited this year. This to, has been... Or this season. Yes, the season of the special guest. <laughs> that's what I nicknamed it at the beginning, and that's what it has been. Uh, it's been a, a joy. It's been enlightening. It's been profound. I mean, every episode has been profound and we've had an increase in listenership uh, viewership so shout out to all our new followers and mm. listeners out there we're glad to have you with us i'm sure that our special guests have attracted you into our orb <laughs> and we're uh, grateful for that and we appreciate you being a part of our conversation on pulpit to side yeah very excited to do this particular episode because it's back to just you and i and one of the things that we talked about uh, offline in preparation for this episode was what should we do to be our season closer, uh, our season finale? And I shared with you, I thought, I said, we should talk about the gospel yes. and its impact on the different individuals that have come here and shared their stories and about not only how it impacted them, but how in some ways it changed their lives. And you said, what to me? <laughs> Jesus is a real person. <laughs> That's, not, <laughs> That's not what, what I said. You said, you, you <laughs> I said, said the gospel is not just an ideology. You, Jesus no, is a real no, person. no. That's what I said. No, but I, <laughs> no. You said that oh. that sounds a bit like preaching. Oh, I <laughs> did say that. And and this is the pulpit aside. <laughs> right. We're not trying to preach out here, Coy. And I said to you, at <laughs> some point. Who we are will come out in what we do. So at some point, there will maybe feel a sense of preaching, even on pulpit aside. But just so you all know, our listeners, <laughs> we are not here to preach to you today. We're simply here to kind of share what we believe is an insight um, that is, while unique to Christianity and our faith, and oftentimes preached in the pulpits in regards to our faith, I think is evidence in the guests that we had this year. Yeah. I mean, pushing the pulpit aside doesn't mean we can't share truth and share a message. I mean, that's why we have a p podcast. Yes. We feel like there's something to be said. And the idea of pulpit aside is that we have an uncommon conversation. Mm. And yeah, maybe it's good for us to hit pause and to talk about what we've seen as the evidence of the gospel and the evidence of Jesus transforming lives. I mean, that's powerful. And I think it's good to be reminded of that, even to take a step back and say, hey, look, you know, mm. it can, I mean, as preachers, as Christians, whatever we are, um, it can be easy to just get in the routine of life. This is what I believe. This is what the Bible says. Yeah. But we need to be reminded. Yeah, it's not just an ideology. It's not just a religion we follow. It's a person. Mm. It's a person named Jesus. And he is still in the business of transforming lives. Yeah. And at the at the core of it, the gospel changes lives. The gospel is good news. Mm. That's good stuff. Yeah. So for this season finale, we're going to look at some of the stories in which we talked about and not only give you guys a refresher, brief refresher of the individual and what that particular story that was shared, but also just highlight or illuminate some aspects of where we see the gospel working in people's lives. And I think that it is good. You kind of alluded to this already, uh, Pastor Jesse. Now, while we do preach sermons and we preach in the pulpit, the power of the gospel and the tra life transforming or transformation power of the gospel, some of our stories that are shared about God's impact in our lives don't have to be in the pulpit. That's in fair. fact, the majority of them should be being shared by us as individuals with those we're coming in contact mm -hmm. with. And so mm -hmm. at that point, we're not preaching. We're simply sharing our testimony. We're sharing our story. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we do that in uh, uncommon conversation. That's right. <laughs> I mean, without planning it, you could say this season uh, overarching theme is the power, the transforming power of the gospel. Yes, yeah, you absolutely could. Uh, and again, that wasn't a plan. It was just we got some friends up here with some stories and let them share their stories. But now looking back 
it's like, man, look at what the Lord has done in and through their lives. And many times it, the complete turnaround, mm. you know, so I think of, um, we had our friend, pastor Jerome Veerling on yes. here and, you know, had grown up and was like on the streets and into drugs and then selling drugs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> So it goes from running the streets to <laughs> loving the streets, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and now leading a church in the inner city um, where their their aim and their mission is to love the city. I mean, yes. Talk about a turnaround. Yes. Yes. That's, that's amazing. And, you know, you think about it in some sense when he talked about parts of his life as a younger man or a young, younger teenager kind of running around selling drugs. You're right. In some sense, you're destroying the streets or the, at least the yeah. individuals who are kind of a part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, lives are being changed negatively mm-hmm. due to the abuse or use of drugs. And then a uh, the little bit of crime that he participated in. And while we really didn't talk much about crime. You know, it's illegal to sell <laughs> drugs. Yeah, <laughs> so that would be a crime. Uh, but then to go to church on that particular Sunday, I want to say he said it was Easter. Yeah, I think so. Heard the gospel clearly being preached mm-hmm. and knowing he needed to go forward. Mm-hmm. And life changing from there. And as you said, from, you know, working in the streets. Or how would you say it? You said <laughs> running, the <laughs> running the streets <laughs> to, to now loving the streets, loving the streets right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that right there was a huge example of how God's redemptive work or God's work in an individual's life doesn't only change them, but it also begins to change their outlook mm-hmm. on everybody around them because yeah. he has one of the fastest growing churches in our area mm-hmm. today, and they're only seven years old, wow. and they have grown exponentially, wow. a lot of it because they are every week, whether they're in the schools, whether they are serving the community with giving away food or putting up basketball goals or cleaning up trash mm-hmm. somewhere. Mm-hmm. They have built a culture over at City Life where they are deeply invested in loving the city yeah. and loving people with the love of Jesus Christ yeah. through serving them. Yeah. They're they're dealing hope instead of dealing dope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can see where hey, this is going hey, now. Hey, okay. hey. <laughs> <laughs> but you know one person you know met by God and and that's what stands out to me I think of Jerome's story you know he's just you know in one sense another statistic mm. a, a, a dude on the streets uh just doing what he had to do or trying to find a good time or whatever I don't know what he was doing you know but God in and, and it wasn't just that you know somebody shared a message with him there was a message preached but in that message was an opportunity where god met him and and that's what that's what strikes me like Mm. it it's it's not just about um information yeah it's about jesus coming face to face with a person and what i was going to say is he's one dude you know god touches one dude and now our city's being impacted Mm. so powerfully and and that should give us hope for the next dude right, that's good you know what i mean yeah like just another person on the streets oh really you know what yeah I mean? what what does god say when he sees that just another person on mm. the street dealing dope you know yeah what can god do if if that person's given the opportunity and god encounters them you know with a life change like um huh. it's, it's powerful story and all of the stories today are just it, there were just one person and and seemingly they would have thought a nobody until, until Jesus, right? Right. And, and and each person would say like, you know, I didn't just like enter into an institution. I met a person. I met a person mm. named Jesus who saved my soul and, and transformed my life. You know, I mean, it's, it's real. This thing we <sighs> preach is real and yeah. it changes real people's lives like every day and we don't even hear all the stories right but uh the way in which god takes someone who's i mean it's it's all the uh well, the cliches we say god takes someone's mess and then makes it their message yeah. you know <laughs> or, yeah. or their test becomes their, their testimony. testimony it's yeah. real it's, yeah. it's real real and and how people who are in a mess and and seemingly forgotten and insignificant insig- suddenly become um, important players in, in his kingdom. Yeah. You know, that's true. It's awesome. You know, we talk about rehabilitation just through, you know, jails or people's lives. And mm. while Pastor Jerome, I don't think he was ever arrested or not, but he may have been, but yeah, I, I, I know he didn't serve any real life time, you know, so 
You think about it, and his life was rehabilitated. You make it sound like you want to put him in jail. Well, talking no. about his illegal activity. <laughs> Sorry, Pastor Jerome. I love you. I don't know about this guy. <laughs> but but the Lord truly, not only we would say redeemed and yes, restored, totally. but the word we would use in the more of a secular context, worldly context, would be rehabilitated, mm-hmm. and then has allowed his story to be something that not only would push him forward, but also invite others into the opportunity that your story is not finished and it can mm-hmm. be just like his. It doesn't have to be what the statistics say you're yeah. going to end up at because of where you started. Yeah. So you know, I it's think it's really cool. Propelling, a, you could say, a rehabilitative movement in our yeah. city. Yeah, absolutely. Let it be. Absolutely. That's so good. That is good. So, so we moved from that one, and then we had our friend Alex Pickens yeah, on a good one. Talk the, about the episode. And Alex Pickens is not only um, have been a pastor of a church at one point in time, but is now serving as a chaplain to the local police, police department here in our city. And when you hear the part of his story as a teenager, when he had his first real encounter with the police, being pulled over as he was going to pick up his younger brother mm-hmm. in a part of town that was, you know, we'll just say more affluent, more white, uh, because his parents had chosen to put his younger brother in a particular school. You know, he's going to pick up his younger brother, and in the process of doing this and bringing him home from school, you know, he's pulled over mm-hmm. in a CVS parking lot and kind of cornered. Yeah. And then treated he, as he if he's done something. He fit a description. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and just that traumatic experience that he had, which taught him that in spite of what he saw on TV, in spite of what he may have heard about racism in our country or police and and black lives or black and brown lives, he now had this experience as a teenage boy in which this officer who happened to be white, again, he wasn't physically beat up, he wasn't put in handcuffs and taken downtown, but just the whole trauma and experience of fitting a description Mm -hmm. and the way he was talked to and dealt with as as if he was guilty. Um, I mean, he was pulled from the car. Yeah, he was in front of his younger siblings. uh, And he kept that to himself. He didn't really want to tell his parents all of what happened. So he's dealing with this experience that is personal to him that, again, regardless of what you hear, what other people say, this was my first experience. Mm -hmm. And he pretty much had determined in his heart and his mind that as far as law enforcement was involved, <laughs> he just needed to stay away. Uh-huh. Okay? Just it's needed to stay away. Place. Right? <laughs> it's unsafe. To God challenging him some probably 20 years later, 15, 20 years okay. later, to not only consider this concept of chaplaincy as he's in ministry, but to actually go and volunteer right. to do ride-alongs right. with officers out in, you know. in the sticks, right? <laughs> right? He said they pulled off into this, you know, they was, was like on this, a, one what, what two lane highway yeah. out, and it was a nightmare come to life. <laughs> right. That's that's what he said. Like Officer. he literally had nightmares about what he was living. Like he, yeah. Officer takes him here, and they just and and of course, you know, they they just simply talk, and he hears the officer's story, but. As the moment was happening, he's like, I'm out here and nobody knows where I'm at. In you know, it's dark. Nowhere, middle, in the middle of the night <laughs> <laughs> in a police car with the, this officer that he said was huge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but that's where the story turned around. It is. You know, right there. And, and he described it so eloquently, too. But like uh, out there on that dirt road under a tree. Mm. You know, which, you know, symbol symbolically, you know, wow. you harken back to lynchings and that sort of thing became not a nightmare, but a redemptive moment where that that officer opened up his heart and his soul to a stranger yeah. named Alex Pickens. Yeah. And the tables turned in a moment and Alex went from, you know, the scared 16 year old boy to a minister of the gospel. Mm. To, to, to to the police officers, right? At this point, he was already in ministry, so yeah. Uh, now right. he's ministering to police officers right. and serving them, ministering to what had been, you know, his closeted biggest fear. Yeah, that it's so like God. It is so like God. <laughs> and, and, and you think about that, you know, the first officer that he came in contact with probably had no idea the type of. Uh, it, I hate to keep using the word traumatic or trauma, but for the sake of we'll say impact. Uh, culture, yeah, impact, we'll do that. So they had, probably had no idea the impact he was going to have on this young man who was, you know, 16, 15, 16, 17 years old, who was doing the right thing. 
You know, Alex has never been in trouble with the law. He's part of the Peace Corps when he graduated. Right. You know, he grew up in church. Then he became a pastor after going to the Peace Corps for a few years. And now he's serving as a chaplain. So, so Alex isn't, you know, you know, Pastor Jerome, you know, a white guy <laughs> growing up in inner city, doing a lot of the stuff. <laughs> and uh, Alex Pickens, you know, African-American kid in the heart of Detroit growing right. up. Right, right. And trying to do the right thing, all mm -hmm. of a sudden, his experience with this officer, I'm sure he had no idea the impact he would have on Alex for so many years. And then I'm sure that the second officer had no idea the impact oh, for sure. that he was now going to bring or have on Alex's life for the latter half mm -hmm. of his life. And you're right, that's just like God. Nobody, nobody there had an agenda but but God. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's almost as if God works through the personal actions of our own at times. Yeah. And, and instead of stopping those actions, he said, okay, so this is going to happen. Yeah. So I'm going to make sure that this happens and, and you know, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to counter right. that impact that yeah. took place. And yeah, you're right. God is, God is so busy playing chess. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be reduced to a pawn on the board, but we definitely know he's got a mastermind plan that is so far beyond us. Absolutely. His ways are definitely so much higher than mm. ours and his thoughts are so much higher and better mm. than, than our ways of thinking. And, uh, you <laughs> know, Alex really shared and, and made it personal, I think, for all of us by, you know, sharing that the heart of the matter wasn't about the issues as much as it was obeying God. Yeah. You know, because um, any of us would give Alex an excuse, you know, as a black guy with, you know, a little bit of policing trauma mm -hmm. and his, his history, a pass on never having to deal with the cops again. You yeah. know, we would have been like, oh, we get it. That's fine. I mean, especially in the wake of 2020 and all the junk that's happened in the last few years. Um, and yet God's like, no, I want you to go down there. Mm. I want you to put your face to your fears. And, you know, at one level, that's the goodness of a good father wanting to heal his heart. Mm. But he didn't leave him there. That's good. You know, he didn't just leave, take him there to free him from his fear and, and heal his heart of that past trauma. He's like, I'm actually going to turn this whole thing around. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and now you will be yeah. the light, uh, you know, of the world to this specific community. And, I mean, I don't know how many, let's just be honest you know i don't know how many black men are chaplains to police forces right in our nation right praise god there's at least one and he's our friend and, and, and here's the other thing about alex he was he's really balanced in now understanding better what officers go through mm -hmm. the lens in which they see through yeah that causes them to make the judgment calls that they make and i think alex would also be one who could who would acknowledge at times their their lens that they're seeing through is still somewhat skewed, but it is kind of based upon what they are seeing and the environment in which they're thrust into yeah, yeah. every day. Yeah. And so he was able to talk from the officer's perspective of, you know, their lives are on the line every day. And this is something that people need to consider mm -hmm. from our side me being black, mm -hmm. um, but also just as a citizen, mm -hmm. that when they show up to a scene, there is a sense of anxiety. There's a sense of, I've been called because something is wrong. Right. And it's my job to fix with or right. mediate what yeah. is wrong. Yeah. And you don't always know what you pulling up into. And so yeah. giving that other side that sometimes is hard for us to hear as citizens, mm -hmm. especially as black and brown citizens, mm -hmm. because we know that racism and what has happened in our past it's a factor too that is a part of the layers that are there. But the thing is layered. And so Alex, you know, really has come to a place where he's walked in both worlds mm -hmm. personally and experientially and is able to navigate it, I, I would say, more accurately. Yeah, I think it helps humanize mm. uh, that side instead of demonize, which is always such a t temptation. And I feel like culturally right now that I see so much uh, demonization. Yeah. You know, we like to draw up sides and draw the line and where this is the right side and you're on the wrong side, you know, um, where the truth is there's humans on both sides. Yeah. You know, real people with real minds, real hearts and trying to, most people trying yeah. to do their best, yeah. you know, to, to do what's right. And, um, you know, one false move and we, we demonize you, you know, yeah. we, we cancel you and all your friends like you. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, I mean, right. That's true. <laughs> And so, so yeah, his ability to just kind of 
have a better balance to navigate that space. And I think that he does it really well. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. he, he speaks very slowly. You can tell he oh. thinks Yo. very deeply before yeah. he articulates yeah. his thoughts and his points. And so he, he, it was just an awesome experience to see how the gospel, even though Alex, again, had been a Christian most of his life, how God is using his redemptive message to, at times, rehabilitate slash even restore yeah, yeah. through the impact of people's actions. Because I don't know if either one of those officers were Christians, right? right? You no. know? <laughs> but they don't were know. used by God. That's right, absolutely. Can God use a person that doesn't even know him? I mean, absolutely. Well, he used, if he no. can use a donkey, yeah. you know, <laughs> then surely he can use you, Coy. <laughs> <laughs> that one was too easy. Yeah, I, mean, I, yeah, I get it. Oh, I see. I shouldn't say I get it. I, I, I got you. Okay. I got, you just said that I got you first. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so from there, we went to... We talked uh, about God and technology. We talked to um, some young folks and Gen Z and Jesus. That was a pretty enlightening episode. That was. Um, you know, and, and great to see their young hearts that are alive for the Lord. Because mm. the statistics say that's not the case. You right. Know, Gen Z doesn't want anything to do with God. Gen Z is the most lost generation. Not a, da, da, da. Well, I don't think that's true. Right. I mean, the gospel is not chained, as the word says, mm. right? I don't remember which epistle that is, but the gospel is always the gospel. Yeah. And it will always come and change lives. And mm. I love the, the zeal, the fortitude, and, and the rootedness that we saw in your daughter mm. and, uh, and my friend Jalen uh, as they shared about that. And, and really, uh, even just the conviction they have is, is a beautiful thing. I think, you know what some would say right now is the most lost generation, I think we're going to be surprised. I think mm. as they come into their own in this next season, I think we're going to be really surprised what the gospel does in wow. and through Gen Z. Wow. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, even when they talked about, you know, many of us in our, mine and your generation, and even before would say that this generation is very entitled. Mm. And talking to, you know, both Jalen and Sierra and getting their perspective, I think that, while it is true, there's they a lot were of willing to admit that. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of entitlement <laughs> that is taking place. Some of that we have to recognize we created we it. Did it. We <laughs> created that because we gave them things and gave them options and choices that in the past sometimes we didn't have. And so that creates a sense of entitlement. But the other thing that you saw as they were talk, telling their stories and kind of talking about the generation in which they are in is that they too want to be challenged. Mm hmm. And at times, because we're unwilling to challenge mm. due to them pushing back a little, we take the pushback as entitlement. Oh, you can't talk to these kids. They think they know everything. And some of us just simply questioning, yeah. why, is, why should I take what you're saying and accept it? And yeah. both of them pretty much communicated, don't stop challenging us. Yeah. And don't stop trying yeah. to tell us what's right because we are listening. And although our questions may be different than the questions you have for your parents and grandparents, right. It's the same idea. So it's not always just entitlement. It is the fact that they have the opportunity to ask questions that you and I might have got slapped yeah. for asking. <laughs> so, you know, because I said so type thing. Right. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think that's so good, actually. I love how you said that because um, while it may be tempting for us, and we could say this because we're, we're older, you know, we're not Gen Z. Um, you know, with the the attitude and time pushback we get to kind of leave Gen Z to themselves, mm. that, that's the temptation. The truth is, if we do that, that is how we will lose Gen Z. Yes. We have to be willing to push in. We have to be willing to challenge. We have to be willing to engage. Yeah. And it can be intimidating, right? Like, they've grown up as digital natives. They do have a lot of information. They do think they know everything. <laughs> Just because you can Google it doesn't mean you... I mean, you may have facts, but you don't have wisdom. Right. You know, but like they, but they were essentially saying, we need it. We know we need yeah. it. We know we want it. And I, I think it's a, it's almost a prophetic call to, to believers who are older to engage. I mean, if you're worried about what's going to happen to our, our culture, to our future, to our, our nation, uh, to the world, to the state of the church, to the state of the gospel, then that should be your invitation to engage. Yes. Yeah. So if we don't engage, the, the fault will not be theirs. Yeah. You know, if the church is lost, if the gospel loses its influence in our nation, it will be ours that we didn't we didn't engage the generation that the Lord is raising mm. up. Yeah. I think sometimes we get lost and probably our generation before us did too with our parents and grandparents. We think that they're bucking truth mm. 
Well, sometimes they're just challenging tradition. That's right. That's it. And That's when they it. start challenging our tradition, we, get we associate it with truth. <laughs> right. Like, wait, wait a minute. This is, this is what's right. right, it's, right. it's like anything else. You know, technology has changed. And if you don't change with the times to make that adjustment, then you'll be left behind. And that would be really your fault, not society's fault. Yeah. I remember a pastor, a friend of mine, who was like a mentor, he shared with me one day about, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when we were starting the church, that he was hoping to retire from pastoral ministries never having a cell phone. I was like, really? He said, yeah, I just think that those are just things that are distractions and this and that people can reach you whenever they want. Uh, so he said, my goal is to retire without ever getting one. Huh. Now, about three years later, he had a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> I <bet> he did. <laughs> so, so, I, so I asked him what happened. Well, his wife had an appointment at the doctor's one day, mm. and things weren't working out, and mm. she couldn't get a hold oh, of him, right? You see, know? that'll do yeah. it. <laughs> she called the church. She called all the people that she would normally call to get him, and he was nowhere to be found. In that moment, you know, his wife needing him, and even his children at times needing him, and there was a way to be available. <laughs> But he had rejected it. Yeah. So he was not carrying a cell phone. And to this day, he still has a cell phone. Oh, I bet he is. Oh, I'm sure he is. And so that's a good, good, good reminder that there are times where things start changing and we don't want to change with them. But we're focusing too much on tradition, how we did things. Um, as a po- and focusing on the bad that could be used in this change, right, 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 right. as opposed to focusing on the good that it could be used for, and then the reality is changing. Yeah, whether you change it's, or not, it's yes, changing. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that's so good because truth doesn't change. No, um, tradi- and traditions have value. Yes, but traditions are not truth. Right. You know, and um, we have to hold them loosely. We have to, to. We have to be willing to to move ahead. You know. Technology may advance, uh, methods may change. Uh, this is what they say: uh, the methods may methods may change, but the message does not. Right. Um, but and yeah, sometimes it's because we view what's new as dangerous, um, and there may be dangers. Think of technology, right? And and cell phones in our pockets. Like, well, now we've got you know. Uh, sinful material pornography in everyone's pocket too you know yes. and then you say well that that's evil that's terrible okay if you end the p- story there sure <laughs> you know but also the the internet has connected the whole world and yeah. you can share the gospel with the whole world in a way that you never could before well the bible know? app so just like I mean, they got pornography too. in their pocket they you got the, the they got the bible in yeah. their pocket you know? i mean so there there's potential um, yeah. In in the progress of society for good or for evil. Um, and typically, if the church runs and hides in caves, then mm. the evil will win. But if we, again, choose to engage, choose to engage the world right where it is and bring truth to bear on, on modern day times, it still has power. Yeah. We talked about God and technology. That was one. And then we did talk about um, just the power of the gospel with our friend, uh, the missionary, yeah. uh, Tyler, who mm-hmm. shared some s- powerful stories from the Middle East and just God breaking in. Yeah. Uh, truth, truth is powerful. Um, the gospel still has power. Yeah. You can have all the technology in the world. You can have all the money. You can have all the influence. But you, you cannot dilute or diminish the power of the gospel. Es- especially when you see it at work. Mm-hmm. You know, when you see God's healing power immediately change somebody, when you are in a situation where someone is dealing with maybe spiritual demonic influences Mm -hmm. and the gospel is being preached, the name of Jesus is being proclaimed, or somebody prays over somebody, and you see immediate changes. I think in our country, we have a lot of ways to scientifically explain that away, to uh, intellectually explain some things away. But there are some places where they don't have all of that at their disposal in that moment. And all this, it was God. Yeah. And the process and the method that was used was one that we see in the scripture. (laughs) And so they said, oh, yeah, it was definitely God. Right. And I, I think that, yeah, when we when we got some of. It was Tyler, right? Tyler's story. Mm-hmm. Um, even for him being challenged some based upon what you may see here as opposed to what you see yep. on the mission field. Yeah. Well, and it just it's a powerful reminder of what we've been saying. The gospel is powerful. And, and that's what the scripture says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Mm. It is the power of God unto salvation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when we don't always see 
um, that power evidenced in front of us uh, in the ways that are, are most tangible, I think there's a danger uh, that we can build doctrines that mm. reason the power out. Yeah. Uh, that's really dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I don't want to make a doctrine around my experience. Just because mm. I don't see the power of God, does that mean God's not powerful today? You know, mm. just because uh, you may not have seen a miracle, does that mean miracles have ceased? Right. <laughs> mm, I know I'm stepping on toes, but I. Because <laughs> well, if you say things like that, then you're saying that ways in which God has worked in the past, He will not work for today. Work in today. And I, and, I don't and, see that as biblical. I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. And it doesn't mean that what God did in the past, he's going to do it today the same way. It just, I'm not going to limit him. Right. He's going to choose how he's going to operate, how he's going to work. And he has given, a, a, given us a plethora of ways over history and how he has worked. Mm -hmm. And too often we believe the testimonies of those who are in scripture. We don't believe the testimonies of those who are living out that same scripture today. And Why, that's unfortunate. I mean... Same, same God. Same God. <laughs> same God. You know, it's interesting. We talk about, you know, in that Romans 1 passage where Paul says, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel yeah. for it's the power to save man's souls. Mm -hmm. He's saying the gospel will save your life. Mm -hmm. But that same gospel will transform your life. But in Acts chapter 9, to. when he is, when he gets converted, he is on his way to Damascus yeah. to find Jews who are following the way. Yes. All right. So the way was the word for saying you're a Christian back right, in this right. time period. And as he's on his way to Damascus, right outside the city, he sees us blinded by this light. He says, who, you know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he's like, who are you, Lord? I'm, I'm Jesus. Who are you persecuting? We see him after three to five days at, later, after he's been hands laid on him by Ananias, scales fall off. He is now in the temple, it says, several days later, preaching alongside the same people right. who he came <laughs> to extradite back to Jerusalem in order to be put in prison wow, or even yeah, killed, yeah. all right? Wow, 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 seven, wow, day, wow. seven, eight days later, he's, he's standing alongside these men yeah. who is at one point in time coming yeah. to bring charges up again spiritually. I, yeah. It'll change your life. Because <laughs> he's saved already, meeting Jesus on Damascus yes. Road. But now he's living immediately differently. I mean, I think you could make a case. I mean, I don't need a case made, but... Um, that to truly encounter the gospel is to be transformed. Yeah. Um, it, it saves your soul, but like, you know, the testimony of Scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, the old has gone, the new has come. Mm. If anyone's in Christ, that is the story. Yes. It wasn't you got a little better, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that you got religion. Right. It's not that you joined the church. If you are in Christ, who you were before is now dead. Yes. And you're a new person. Mm. And the case you could make is, if that's not true, then you didn't experience the gospel. <laughs> I like. I mean, it. you're laughing like hey, that's hey, no, controversial. No, no, that's good. Because you, no, you might have heard it. <laughs> you might have been exposed to it. It does not mean that you personally experienced it for yourself and then began to do what it does. You might be Save sitting your soul in church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Tuesday mm -hmm. night, Bible study. Yeah. And still not be changed that's by that's the right. power of the gospel. That's right, because you you are not really experiencing it. That's true. Uh, we call them what? What wolves in sheep's clothing? Ooh. All right. What the the day came where the sons of God came before him, and Satan was with them. Mm. All right. Job chapter one. All the angels in there don't recognize the devil, and, and Jesus and the Lord is like, "Hey, Satan, where you coming from?" All right? <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, I mean, if, if Satan can go back to heaven. Mm. And, and Jesus will talk about wolves in sheep's clothing, then that means sometimes Satan or his henchmen or those who are following him mm. are sitting in church mm. and hearing but not believing. But that would be no different than Jesus preaching to the crowd. Yeah. That this message yeah. is for all of yeah, you, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. not all of you are going to accept it. You're hearing it. You even saw the miracle. <laughs> you ate from the miracle itself if you ate from that two fish and five loaves, but you still don't believe. The old is gone, the new has, new has come. come. That's, that's good. That, that's, that is the evidence of the power of the gospel in that's anyone's good. life. Um, so, yeah, we, we heard some cool stories from the Middle East, and our last two episodes were by far the, the oh my most goodness. popular. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Did you want to say <laughs> and, and, something I mean, about so we, we, we talked to uh, uh, John, right? Mm -hmm. Same-sex attraction. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of, that was part of what we focused on, mm -hmm. was same-sex attraction. Uh, and then we talked to to Jade, mm -hmm. who struggled with 
tra- tra- being transgender. I mean, she lived transgender. Well, she lived it for yes. ten years. Yeah, we'll say that she <laughs> lived transgender because if I say struggle, I might say so she lived it for ten years. She owned it. Yes. <laughs> uh, but hearing their stories. Oh my gosh. And being able to not only hear their stories but help them further articulate and express for us the ongoing struggle of either same-sex attraction or feelings that one once had and maybe at times still has to fight off about, you know, transgender. Mm -hmm. Man, that was so powerful to hear their perspectives, but then to put it in light of the gospel Mm -hmm. and their relationships with the Lord Mm -hmm. Where it did not really, from my perspective, uh, take away from the experiences that they had had mm-hmm. or even currently experiencing mm-hmm. just with sin mm-hmm. and, and, and sexuality. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, trying to acknowledge the spiritual truths and principles that they are trying to guide their lives mm-hmm. by because of the impact of the gospel and Jesus on their lives. I just thought it was awesome. Oh, I mean, they, they are the example of the scripture I was just quoting. You know what I mean? Mm. Like they ha- they met the Lord and they they had to say goodbye and death to their old mm. self and yes to new life in Christ. Mm. And they would say no regrets. You know what I mean? Right. You know, even if there's a struggle today, it, I, I think what's powerful about having their stories on here. And obviously one of the reasons I invited them <laughs> uh, is to humanize those people, you know, yeah. because we can get. Um, real heated when we talk about causes and issues and, Mm. um, you know, agendas in today's society. But if we can humanize the people on the other side of those buzzwords, then we can see that God has a heart for them and is longing to transform them. You know Mm. what I mean? Like if we consider that someone who uh, is same sex attracted or would, claim themselves as gay or bisexual is somehow completely and forever lost, then we've given up hope for them Mm. and we won't present hope to them. Mm. Like, what are we even doing? Mm. Um, Yeah. I mean, I don't want, you know, evil ideologies being shared in our public schools. I'm not going to sit back and say, well, that's okay. But by the same time, uh, we have to have hope for those who are on the other side of yeah. those those buzzwords, on the other side of those issues, and be willing to present a life changing truth, a life changing no person, yeah, named Jesus, mm. and let him be Jesus, let him be God, let God be God. You know, I was uh, hearing Jade's story again. She was sharing in one of the, the local schools here. I took her with me, and um, you know, she shared again about how she's in the middle of her her life of sin, really, mm. but had come to the place where she was at the end of herself. And she said, I, I think she said she was in the shower. It doesn't matter where she was, but she prayed this prayer and she's like, God, the, the, the one true God, whoever you are, mm. she didn't know who she's talking to. Mm. If you're real, help me, you know, reveal wow. yourself to me, meet me. And, and then within weeks, two <laughs> to three strangers come talking to her about Jesus. About Jesus. <laughs> All right. So who's the one true God? <laughs> who <laughs> hears from heaven. I mean, all her options were open. She wasn't spiritually close. She'd been practicing new age and witchcraft. And like, she had done all the things mm. spiritually. And she's like, one true God, wherever you are, whoever you are, I need you. And who shows up? <laughs> Jesus, 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 Jesus. Like I'm, Hey, uh, you're, you're preaching. Let's let God be God. Are you, you preaching right saying? now? Are like, you preaching? <laughs> I mean, because you'd want to correct her, right? Oh, I know who the one true God, he knows who he is too. And he's Mm. really good at showing up when we let him show up. And he just showed up in her life. He did. That's it. Yeah. You know, I loved how John talked about the concept of sexual sin. Mm. So keeping it all in the context of even as a heterosexual, as heterosexual men, there is sexual sin that we still have to deal with and our own lust and what we do with that lust. And then even being married, mm-hmm. you know, adultery, not committing adultery, et cetera, et cetera. And when you think about it, something you just said, we're so often writing off a particular community as if there is no hope. So right. therefore we don't give them the hope. Right. And man, there are a lot of heterosexuals who 
are not accepting this message. Yeah, yeah. We imagine <laughs> that somehow these groups of people are different than us. Yes. And the beautiful sanctification story that John was telling us is we're actually not all that different. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there is hope for individuals in every group, no matter how you yeah, categorize yeah. them. There is hope for them to not only hear the gospel, but then to be changed and transformed by it, just as it was in whatever group you're part of. Right, right. And so that was a, another huge, just I think, idea that I gleaned from listening to John, but also Jade and sharing their stories. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. Yeah. I think John's message that came home clear was first to see his desire to follow the Lord no matter the cost, mm. but the message of that it's the same for all of us. Like we have to be willing to uh, surrender our whole self to the Lord and subject mm. our desires to him, you know, to the Holy Spirit, subject our desires to the truth of the word. And that's the truth for anyone that says they want to follow Christ. That's true. Just, just as you were saying, like, and so it's, it's actually not that different. Like it's not a special category, uh, you know, for someone who may be same sex attracted or heterosexual. If, if your desires are trying to lead you to sin, those are desires you have to submit to the Lord yes. and say yes to his way over your way. Every day you wake up, it's not my way, it's your way, mm. Lord. It's not my, you know, and, and when we draw those hard lines, you know, especially about sexuality, well, oh, you're same sex attracted, like, and put, make that a special category. Then we, then we give ourselves a pass. Well, I'm not that, so I must be I, you know, no, mm. you still, when you lust, that's still sinful. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you're still disobeying the Lord. Yeah. You are not in subjection to his will <laughs> in that moment. You are not. Whether your lust is heterosexual or homosexual, it's sin. Yes. Yes, that's, that's good. You know, it's interesting because I think sometimes, you, and when you said earlier, we have given up hope because we think there's no hope. So we give up sharing the hope. We feel like there is no hope. Over the course of time, categories change. Mm. I mean, categories change. So today we're dealing with, in our culture and the climate that we're in, you know, transgender, homosexuality, bisexuality. So that's a huge one, which is part of the reason why we probably give up hope. But, you know, 50 years ago, or I should say 100 years ago, 200 years ago, I'm sure those who look like me on the outside mm -hmm. here running around in earth color suits that are brown, were looked at like, hey, there's not as much hope for this particular community. Mm. Hey, during the days of slavery, they actually said that, and after that, black people were cursed because we came from the tribe of Ham. Wow. And curse usually means that there's not no much hope. hope. And so regardless to w whether we're talking about the Holocaust, slavery, sexuality, uh, at one point in time, you know, even the prohibition of alcohol, you know, I'm sure that that has some spiritual roots behind mm -hmm. why they were trying mm -hmm. to ban alcohol and all of a sudden mm -hmm. everybody is bad. Uh, at some point, your group or your number will be called and you will mm -hmm. find yourself in a demographic or in a group of individuals in which we are giving hope up on when in actual reality, that is the very place that we should be trying to communicate the hope to. Yes. Because there's always hope. Yes. And it's this, it's really the root of the same. And not to over spiritualize, but let's call maybe call it what it is. The plan of the devil is yeah. is always to demonize and dehumanize. You know, mm. you talk about the history of of slavery and race in our nation. Mm. That's what that was. It was a dehumanization. I mean, we even think of like the progression of like, well, not a full person. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's demonic. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yes. Because at every level, it's trying to take an image bearer, mm. no matter the color of their skin or their orientation, mm. and, and, and set them on another, like on a lower level to dehumanize and demonize them. That That is demonic at, yeah. at the core. Yeah. Right. There's some that would and it hasn't been very successful, so it's not even worth mentioning. But some would like to in our current culture now begin to t turn that same demonic agenda on white men. Right. Like, let's demonize and de dehumanize yes. them. It's their fault. They did it. And sure, they did. <laughs> right. <laughs> But you can say that as a white man. Go ahead. I mean, I can. I mean, they did. I mean, Adolf Hitler was a white man, uh, you know, and these these early, you know, fathers of our nation were white men. And mm -hmm. they 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 did do that. Mm -hmm. But does that make white people, you know, specifically white men, white men? Right. You know, we, we could we could demonize them. Yes. We can dehumanize them. Yeah. And make them lesser than. And, and again, is the same agenda of the, it's all the same agenda. 
it's the same demonic agenda. It is. Uh, it just depends on the, the day or the hour mm. who, who the spotlight is on, you know? Wow. That's good stuff. Jesus always humanized the person in front of him. He did. He valued the person in front of them. Like, and, and that, that was a big deal. Mm. You know, when the woman caught in adultery is, is thrown at his feet. Like, mm. he valued that woman. He didn't, he didn't compromise truth. Right. He didn't change his standards of holiness, but he didn't treat her like a dog. You mm. know, and then, I mean, he, he valued her, humanized her, um, forgave her, restored her, and then said... <laughs> go and sin no more yeah right we yeah. want to be like stop sinning <laughs> and then come to jesus no <laughs> jesus how about come to jesus and he'll 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 take care of your sin you know what i mean like yeah. but th- every encounter you know in the story of the good samaritan that wasn't jesus there but a story told but i think of like zacchaeus this corrupt man who had taken advantage of his own people mm. jesus like i'm gonna come eat at your house today <laughs> The offense in the crowd. Can you imagine who who would have liked an invitation to for Jesus to come to their house? This is probably one of the most despised people <laughs> in the land. Jesus, you, I'm hanging out with you yeah. today, and because he saw the value in that man, though his actions had been corrupt and evil. And then, like the Roman centurion, for crying mm. out loud, these people were harassing the Jewish people. What what right does he have to come ask the Jewish rabbi Messiah to heal? Yeah. You know, but Jesus did. He did. You know what wow. I mean? Like every time Jesus encountered a person, it was about their value to him. Not mm. not as much about their sin because he knew he was the answer for yeah, that. Yeah, that's good. And what if we reminded ourselves that's on an it. ongoing basis that no matter who you're dealing with, even in the midst of their sin, Jesus is the answer to that. For the white supremacist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For the transgender person. Yeah. For the drug dealer on the street. Right. You know? Jesus is the answer. And I think that we we do we lose I don't think we forget it. We just lose sight of it in the moment. Mm-hmm. So now when I see or I get pulled over by an officer who's mm-hmm. white and male, I have to remind myself, even if even if I'm mistreated, that mm-hmm. Jesus is the answer to what's going on. And can I see this individual in light of Jesus and vice versa? Let's say the officer, they don't know who I am. Mm-hmm. And let's say on this particular day, I've had a bad day and mm-hmm. I'm a little bit more <laughs> aggressive in my tone. Like, right. why you put me over, man? <laughs> like, what's going on? Like, <laughs> like, in that moment where I may not be reflecting Jesus like I should, I'm reflecting more on my flesh. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesus is the answer to that. Yeah. So yeah. that's good. Well, I mean, I, it sounds like oversimplification, but... If he is who he says he is, and his gospel is the power that the word says it is, it's enough. Mm. That was Jade's story. Yeah. Jesus was enough. Like, again, she was sharing her story again, so it's fresh in my mind. Um, But, yeah, she prays, God, whoever you are, come to me. And, you know, three different people like Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Mm. Um, And then someone comes to her and says, um, you know, I don't remember exactly what it was, but some of the effect of, you know, you know, God is real, you know, uh, his love is real and you just have to do, you, you've got to do what it takes. Um, it was something very general, something very bland. Um, but she knew in her heart in that moment that what was being said to her by God was you have to detransition. Mm. Uh, but the point I'm making with this story though, is that like nobody had to take a Bible and knock her over the head with it. Right. Like God himself was enough to draw her to himself and then to convict her of her sin and lead her out of it. Yeah. Like no one was there like, you're being wrong. You are evil. You've been living this sinful lifestyle. You got to, I mean, nothing wrong with preaching and repentance, but that for her, that wasn't what she needed. Right. She just needed to meet Jesus and she did. And so he, he was the one that said, time to change your life. Yeah. You know, time to come back to who I made you to be. And because he said it, she was willing to say yes, and she had grace to do it. Amen. I mean, it, it <laughs> re- he really is big enough to yeah. be a savior. You know, yeah. he really is well, I good like enough that. To, to lead us into all truth. Uh, and, and I'm not, I mean, to balance that, I'm not saying don't speak the truth, but um, 
you know, if we're going to be truth tellers, let's let's be just as much of compassion carriers. Well, well let's do it. Let's complete the verse. Speak the truth in love. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's not just speak that truth. Part. Let's do it all in I mean, love. But people slap that as a as an okay on like I'm just speaking the truth in love. Right. Well, we ain't feeling the love <laughs> right. right now, bro. You know? <laughs> so. No, that's 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 good. Well, I tell you what, this has been an awesome opportunity to kind of recap. Yeah. The different um um the different podcasts that we had and different guests that we had. And if you listen to this and you miss one of the ones that we're talking about or you heard it and want to kind of re-listen to it, uh, we encourage you to do that, to hear these stories again and to find not only great joy and delight in hearing the stories, at times even a struggle mm. uh, and some tension in hearing them, but ultimately being able to see how the gospel not only saves a soul but transforms a life. It, it, Jesus is good enough. And at times we need to be looking for how the gospel is working and operating and how God is using the gospel to operate in individuals' lives and their stories by listening to their stories, hearing them, and then looking for the gospel and the hope that it has brought to their lives. So good. This has been an amazing season. So are we coming back for season three? I think I think we're going to come back, you know. <laughs> I think we're going to come back. Wait a minute. I'm not tired you of you just yet. You excited know, about hey, it. Hey, I might uh, need to find a new host. Well, Whoever's <laughs> out there, you just... <laughs> I need somebody with some zeal on this thing. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Listen, if you if if you don't want us to come back, tell us. That's oh. what that's what they, we'll let our listeners decide. Uh, no, we'll let them decide. Wait, we'll them, no, <laughs> 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 no, we will definitely be back. We're excited for a third season. We will be back. We will definitely be back for a third season. And so, you guys, in the meantime, just keep listening, keep praying for us, and look forward to another fun field season of the pulpit aside thanks for joining us if you have not yet be sure to like share subscribe leave a great review that thing helps other people see us and hear us too and until next time we'll push the pulpit aside god bless take care